going to be discussing the Just a few, a few uh, details here before we get going. Uh, there's still some assignment twos up at the front that don't relate to the last class. Uh, Daryl will have assignment three ready. We'll pick up on Thursday's class, so uh, that will be ready then. And then assignment four will be distributed on Friday and you will be part of that. Um, just also on the project outlines, there's a notice post on the website about uh, single page outlines for the project. That's mainly intended for me to make sure that you're on the right track in terms of the focus of your project. Uh, I don't want to wait till November when you discover that you, your focus is too broad or too narrow. So this is just a way for me to check that uh, the scope of your unit that you're looking at sizing is appropriate. Uh, so the group, uh, just ask for a short description of the unit, uh, some references. Uh, the request there, I've had some people ask about web references, uh, mainly for the fact that I don't want uh, many web references. I don't want your primary source of information to be something like Wikipedia or, or something of that nature. So if you use that as a starting point to find other references, uh, Wikipedia, you should get some valuable guidance for some other resources to go look at. But those certainly should not be your primary source of information. Uh, use them as a, as a starting point. Company websites are, are generally okay, government websites from government agencies and so forth are, are, are fine as well. Um, but then there's a good set of references on the course website like the Owens Encyclopedia, Perry's Handbook, all of those are from the normal parts of And so the project focuses primarily on how the unit will be sized, and then there's a side objective as well that we uh, talk about capital and operating costs. Okay, so questions about administrative details. Any questions on that so far? So the project, uh, that outline is due electronically on Thursday, and I'll comment on it and, and so you can get started, because I think the hand-in for the report is, is early in the middle of the Okay, so uh, let's just talk about the next <coughs> The midterm, and I really appreciate the time that you took to comment on the course website. So uh, it's, I must admit, it's really hard to accept anonymous feedback. Um, it's, uh, it's some very strong feelings there, so that was good. I, I, I accept that. The, the general consensus was that it was hard, too long, it was unfair, and that you were unprepared for it. So the easy way out for me is just to say, well, let's divide by 80 for the day and let's move on, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, as I read the emails and, and the comments, I, I wouldn't say, I've got angry questions. Well, I haven't been angry since I've like been 16 years old, so I'm not an angry person. I became frustrated, I guess. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about the midterm, and I want to clarify that. I really feel that we need to be clear on uh, the expectations here. So, uh, what I did is rather than me just talking, talking for, um, or on it. I, I put my thoughts down in bullet points here just to help guide me. So the first main issue was that people's uh, concept of the midterm was that it was hard. Um, I found it was mainly conceptual. A lot of the questions, you, you had to understand the concepts and that's, I, I explicitly said that on the course website. It's, it's a conceptual um, You should not be looking around in your textbooks and notes for answers some of these questions. Uh, it is an open book exam, yes, but it doesn't mean that you, you uh, have less study time. In fact, you probably need to put a bit more time in um, and create something like a cheat sheet for yourself so that you can guide your learning. The time spent looking up information like molecular weight cutoff and simple concepts that really should be on the top of your head is an inappropriate use of your time in the, in the midterm. Uh, so what I, my main point here is that if you're saying it was hard, I am hoping that by December when you look back at this midterm, you should be able to say it was actually quite easy. Because in my mind, it was not a hard midterm, it wasn't overly easy, it was definitely just middle of the road. It's a classic middle of the road midterm for any of my courses, is this, this level. So it may feel hard right now, but you must be able to say by similar when you look back at it, this is relatively straightforward. Uh, there was nothing in there that was tricky by any means or really conceptually difficult to, to solve. Um, so it may feel a little bit overwhelming now, but in my opinion, it actually isn't. Um, 
there was some concern that questions were vague. Uh, the comment was specifically, it felt like there were multiple answers to the questions. And this is something I do see on course evaluations. Um, pretty much every course evaluation I've had since working at the university now for about like four years, I've seen this. Um, one issue might be simply is my British English, that's fine. Um, the other is vague, it comes probably from the fact that my questions are always fresh. I never take textbook questions, so you will never see these questions in Gene Coppolis or any book. It's always um, I make the questions as, as I see, see them. So they're, they're not like textbook questions which are tried and tested by university students and many other universities prior to this. So the reason why I do that is simply when I look at these textbook questions, they're just bullshit. They really are. If you look at the questions, they say, super diffusivity is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Find the flux. Well, that's just stupid. We never do that in practice. Right? It's, it's, it's the opposite way around. These, questions, these textbook questions really are not how you use the material. <coughs> so I refuse to, to use that as my uh, testing material or assignment material. But uh, when things are vague, please don't just say, I felt the exam questions were vague. I would like you to, if this is your opinion, uh, they, were, they were from some of you, uh, please, I, I won't do this now. We won't go through every question in the exam. Um, but for example, one thing that would really help me a lot is if you did go back to the midterm. Okay, so for example, here, question three, give three advantages of using a centrifuge over sedimentation. To me, that's not vague and likely, I don't think anyone feels that way, that it's vague. But um, to me, one question that may have been vague looking back is, here, what is the MWCO? So you ask, think to yourself, well, is Kevin wanting the acronym, molecular weight cutoff, or does he want an explanation of molecular weight cutoff? Either one I will accept as an answer. I'm not unreasonable if I see people answer just in the oh, is this, or they explain it in a sentence, well, we're going to be fine. Um, so that may be, to, to me, that is the vaguest question on the midterm. But if there's anything else that's vague, um, please would you say to me in the feedback form, question one, part eight, I felt this was vague because I wasn't sure whether you were looking for this or that. So that will really help me improve um, my question style and clarity for future, uh, which is if this, this seems to be a recur recurring theme, uh, I definitely want to improve that. Um, sometimes my suspicion is, as I said up here, uh, sometimes my suspicion is that people read the questions too quickly, very hurriedly. You kind of read what you want to read. Uh, you, you, you say, this, this must be what he's looking for. Uh, and then you can look at it back later, you're not, uh, you're not sure. So that's my suspicion sometimes, but also if it genuinely is vague, I, I would, would like to know. Um, and also bear in mind that sometimes in my midterms and in the final exam, and in the, especially the, um, the take-home exam, the question are genuinely set to have multiple answers. There is no single right way of doing this. So many times that's part of the deal, and, and that's because we're getting to a part of your curriculum now. In second year and third year, you ask answer questions that are more um, more close in. There's one right way of doing it. But as we're getting now to third year, fourth year, and, and uh, final year courses, things get more open. There's not one right way of doing this. If, there was, if that were the case, every chemical plant would be built identical. Every wastewater treatment solution would be identical. Uh, and it's not, it's not the case. So, so that's, that's sometimes Part of, the, part of the question is that we accept and, and anticipate multiple answers. Then um, the next one is too long. This was um, just some, some, some issues here that I want to clear up first. When uh, we say the Vinton's weight is 15% and people were commenting, this is too long for the weight that, it, for the weight that this Vinton uh, has in the course. So yes, it's 15% of your grade, the final exam will be 45% of your grade. So the time of the exam is not proportional to the weight of the grade. If that were the case, your final exam would be nine hours, and it's not. I mean, also conversely, if your final exam is three hours, and it's going to have to be one hour. It doesn't work that way. The weighting is also not proportional to the difficulty. Um, so 15% midterm shouldn't be one third as difficult as the final exam. Uh, if that were the case, also you'd be reading for a really 
terrible final exam because this to me was a, a typical midterm. So the weighting of the midterm versus the final exam is not a function of the difficulty, it's not a function of the time, it's only a function of the map, the material coverage. So we're one third of the way, October 10th, October 6th, uh, or was, sorry, October 11th was the last class prior to the midterm. So that's about one third of the way into the, into the material of this course that represents that 15 versus 46. That's all, all it comes down to. Um, people said also it's too long given the number of questions. It's, um, I have my first midterm for 463 had 16 questions. Nine questions is fine. Final exam made 12. The number of questions has absolutely no bearing um, in it at all. So, so please, that's, that's not an issue either. So let me take a look at what I should see you using as your time breakdown for this particular midterm. It was stressed in the top of the exam that time management was important. Uh, question one, two, six, eight, and nine were essentially free marks. Uh, you should get pretty much 100% of those if you understand the concepts covered. So question one was those 10 very quick short questions. Question two was asking uh, uh, to mention three separations, uh, sorry, three advantages of centrifuges over sedimentation. That should be off the top of your head. Why the heck did we ever study centrifuges and then sedimentation? So this really should be, I, I don't even need to look this up. This is three minutes, uh, sorry, yeah, three marks. This should take you about a minute to write down the answer to that. Um, question six was asking, Name three global separations that, uh, sorry, separations of global importance to society. Again, that was six marks to mention three separations. You've got to know carbon capture and sequestration, water treatment, desalination. Those are three that simple lines that you write down in less than a minute, six marks. The easiest six marks in the midterm. Uh, question eight was uh, asking about the flow sheet from MIT, which really was just a way to, to see if you understood the concepts of flocculation and the <coughs> concept of, um, what, of what, what a membrane separation is doing. We mentioned that the classic case of membranes is to separate proteins from, from the case of um, So question eight for 12 marks, um, very straightforward. And then the final question nine uh, was essentially just looking at a flow sheet and saying, well, the underflow goes here, the overflow goes there, they get combined, there's a bit of a recycle. And you have to understand the principle that the underflow gets the larger size particles, the overflow gets the, the smaller size particles. That's, that's a straightforward understanding of what cyclones do. So those, those 40 marks really should be done in under 30 minutes. Um, that's all the quick, quick free marks that you essentially should not even open a book for those, those five questions, in my mind. Um, then question four was the one on the separation factor. This may have thrown you a little bit because you're now looking at an economics equation and relating it back to a separation factor. So how do you get those logical steps there? That was, should take about 10 minutes to figure that out. We've got this intuitive understanding that a large sedimentation vessel will do a better job of separating, but how do you relate that back to the separation factor? So there, that question, the, the two things, it combines the concept of separation factor, which we learned right at the start of the course, and it combines it up with the concept of sizing the reactor for a certain degree of clarity. So those two concepts that we've been distinguishing of course, bringing those two together is something you're going to see in this midterm. If you're taking 4C, four, four uh, which would be the stats course. When I examine these questions, the questions are not this part is related to this one section of the course. It's, it's, you're learning the whole course. The material needs to be brought together and you need to understand it as, as one. Uh, then uh, questions five and seven were the two parts of the term that gave you essentially relatively straightforward marks. If you're used to what I call plug and chug, you, you pull out the correct equation from your notes, that's really the only time you should ever look back at your notes in the midterm, is to find the correct equation for question five, which was asking to get the terminal settling velocity. This we've seen in the assignments, we've seen this in class. So pull out that correct equation, substitute the values in, uh, iterate through Stokes' law and the, and the equation for the uh, CD. 
And then question seven was the centrifuge equation, so using the equation for sigma and uh, substituting in there for Q-cut. So those I called plug and chug, 20 minutes, uh, 10 marks, uh, sorry, 10 minutes per question, uh, total of 20 marks under the minute. So as I, as, as I put here, literally if this is the thing that you can do well, plug and chug, which is what we do, which we ask our second year and third year students to do, then you can be outsourced to a computer. It's that simple. If that's really all you're capable of doing well, you've got a problem because you will lose your job in 10, 15 years. If that's all you can do. You've got to be able to creatively take the concepts from this course and other courses and combine them and come up with, with ways of thinking about the material that are non-unique, that, that solve problems that are relevant to troubleshooting those problems or problems related to the economics of the process or how to use an existing piece of equipment and make it do something else. This is uh, something that you do as an engineer that will make you valuable for your company. If you're just able to substitute into equations, that's done by a spreadsheet. You set it up once and it's done. But, so this is not something that you, you should only be good at. You definitely need to do this well, but it's not the only thing that you do. So that, this is one reason why I really want to go through this um, and emphasize that point. We really do require you to think much more creatively as an engineer. And then, surprisingly, out of all of this, people saying that this was too long, um, yeah, 65% of you left early. So, and some of you wrote in your scripts, I give up, or I'm out of patience, uh, it's, too, it's too much for me. You just essentially gave up. Literally wrote that in the script. And then, um, yeah, I'm a stats guy, I keep track of numbers, 65% of you didn't leave early. So, yeah, it's too long, but my God, you've got to persevere. You've got to persevere. When something is not working out for you, don't just give up. Okay? That's, um, again, the, the classic person in a company is not going to get stick around in that job for very long if you're just going to give up when something doesn't work out for you. Okay, so please, please uh, uh, keep going at uh, related to that, people were asking, why do I have to hand this back in here in class today, this question? If I did it wrong in the midterm, I'm just going to do it wrong again and hand it in wrong, I'm going to lose marks twice. I got about four emails saying something to that effect. That's exactly the same concept, don't give up. The purpose of you getting to redo it again is not to simply repeat the same mistake you made in the midterm. <laughs> the purpose of you asking me to redo this again is to see Given this extra time that you've had now, you've had five days now to have this material at all, has it made any difference? Have you gone and looked back at the notes and figured out where I might have gone wrong and can I do it better the next time? The purpose is not to redo the same mistake again the first time. Okay, so if you relate to that, please don't just give up and, and lose patience. Then the, um, some people were saying it's unfair. Um, well, to me, unfair is if I didn't cover this concept at all, or it's totally beyond your capability. And I'm hoping that what's on this slide will convince you this question was not unfair. Firstly, there was prior notice that question three was going to be important. Uh, that is a question like that, which is exact, very similar to the question we covered in class the prior day, except in the class on the prior day, we were solving for the area, this time we were solving for concentrations and flow rates. But the setup of the problem was identical. Um, class was cancelled for questions. There were actually people here in the class that asked, asked questions that were related to questions that turned out to be what was question three. So that was important for you to come if you had some unsolved issues. In my mind, one and a half days or one day if you don't count, if you, if you do actually sleep, um, is not too short for this. Um, in practice, you will have hours to master material and apply it. Two examples. When I was working in Glaxo, I was asked to model the equations for an explosion-proof container to see that the size of the container would blow out to a certain uh, distance and be, and be safe. I have never modeled explosions in my life. There's a moving front of vapor moving at an incredibly rapid velocity. You've got to look up equations for burning and see the energy released and how that's impacting on this panel and how far it will be thrown. This is not something we do as chemical engineers ever, but it had to be solved and we had to come up with a design that day. Another example was to model 
the effect of ambient temperature on a propellant that was being injected into a gas canister that would have been uh, like shaving foam type uh, consistency product. So what is the effect of ambient temperature on overfilling or underfilling <coughs> this propellant because the propellant is going to expand and contract based on, on ambient heating in the sun. There was an answer required the next morning and it was midday. The previous day I had about six to eight hours to find the equations, find the physical properties, create the presentation, do the simulation, and uh, present a report on that, on, on, on using concepts that have just learned. So this is not something that's <coughs> unusual. Um, I will emphasize that you will, uh, that this is quite normal to learn new material and then have to apply it right away. And I'm not the only professor that does this. I, I'm pretty sure of that. I know that other profs also have have the material in tests and exams or even assignments. You've just learned it, you have to use it. Right so this is not, uh, in my mind, not short notice. Um, but also, more, more importantly than that, really, the concepts that you needed to solve question three were covered not on Thursday, but were covered prior. The main concepts you needed to solve question three was, first, you had to understand what's flux. Flux was covered two weeks ago in terms of membranes and covered even further back when we were looking at sedimentation. So the concept of flux is something that you know from previous courses and from this course we've seen intensively. Where is the flux measured? That was the biggest hang-up that people had. People were not clear that flux is the flow through the membrane. People were assuming flux is the flow of the retentate or some other stream uh, coming into the membrane or the food coming in, but flux is the flow through the membrane. And we covered that quite clearly on Tuesday's class. Um, flux is also the flow of the permeate QP divided by the area. That, if you understand the previous point that flux is the flow <coughs> through the membrane, then the fact that that's QP is, is clear, um, but we did emphasize that in Thursday's class. So really the only new material that we covered that you needed to solve question three was, in my mind, the fact that we were connecting these two units up in series. That's the only new conceptual um, idea, and that to recognize that it's the retentate from the first membrane that cascades into the second membrane. Other than that, the concepts that you needed to solve question three were, were not totally new to you. They were from this week, and Tuesday, or all prior in the, in the class. So, um, so I, we'll go through the problem now in a minute and, and we'll emphasize that. But then also that this, uh, this really concerned me, people were saying this year, this course is very different from the past years, it's making it impossible for me to prepare for this. Um, all you have is examples you do in class and assignments. But the key is that like, studying from past papers is not the way to be studying. If, all that, if that's what you do, then all you're doing is, is successfully learning the material of how the professor of the previous year examined it. Um, and that's not appropriate. And <coughs> actually understanding the material and want to use this material as an engineer in the future, <coughs> this will, doing that, studying past papers, will get you through this course or through a course, but it's not going to get you to use the material successfully one day. When, one day when you need it, you're going to have to Re -go back, reboot and go back all the way to the beginning of the day all over again. All you did was, when you previously learned it, you just learned it to pass. Um, so this to, my, this, to my mind, is that equivalent of the no child left behind in the United States where the teachers just teach to make the students pass the test. And that's not what, not what this class is about. Um, so, so to me, the skills you need are, you really need a fundamental understanding of the material and not just saying, okay, to answer this question, I solved it in this way. And to answer that question, I solved it in this cookbook manner. If all you're doing is following a cookbook approach to answering questions, again, you can be outsourced to another computer, or you, you essentially know better than just a, a regular high school student. If all you need is a cookbook approach to follow A to B to C to D to E, you really must be able to think about the problem. That's the key thing, is thinking. Uh, and then finally, people's message was that I felt unprepared. This came up several times, but this was one quote that, that captured it quite, quite interestingly. It said, I felt unprepared. Uh, I felt that attending lectures and completing homework assignments would not have prepared me for the test. 
evidently the test had very little similarity to past examples for assignments. Uh, again, this comes into the fact that we're seeing the problem over and over, or pro seeing problems of a certain type and hoping they come up again in the exam is not a, not a useful way to go about learning. But then, just to counteract all of that, all of the material in the, in the uh, exam was seen in some way in the course notes or in the assignments. And I give a breakdown there from question by question exactly how that was true. So this is just, that's incorrect. Um, the material we have seen in class and in science is very much appropriate to the unit. I will be teaching you examples in the class and not expecting you to solve examples in assignments that are totally different to the midterm style. Uh, again, coming back to those useless exercises that you see in the back of textbooks most of the time, if, if my assignments and examples in class were of that nature, I wouldn't be teaching. <coughs> Okay, so let's break down question three and go through this one carefully. Um, the main reason why I want to do this is you've handed it in here, you've had a chance to think about it. Let's let's see how your thinking matches up with what I was expecting. So the first part of the question asks, it says there's an asymmetric culture filtration membrane. So we know we're dealing with culture filtration here. It's used with the aim of separating dyes from a liquid stream to achieve a more concentrated dilute solution. So we're, we're concentrating out the solution, we're increasing the concentration of the dye. This is no different than saying we want to increase the concentration of the protein in our, in our, uh, in our mixture, or here we're just dealing with dye. So we're going from some low concentration to a high concentration. And if you skip ahead to the questions, we're, going, we're seeing then uh, part one of the question was asking to find that dye concentration. And then part two was asking for flow rates, part three for another dye concentration, and so forth. So it was quite clear that our aim here is to find concentrations of the, of the outlet from the membrane. The <coughs> then we're given some information the fever rise of flow rate of 2.2 meters per hour and concentration of 1.2 kilograms per meter cubic solvent. So already, you can start drawing a diagram, and we introduced in last class this notation Q and C. Q being the flow rate of the incoming stream and concentration. So Q is 2.2 kilogram, uh, sorry, meters cubed per hour. So this is meters cubed of solvent per hour, and then C0 is equal to 1.2 kilograms of solids or dye. Want to emphasize that for the media key. So C0 <laughs> always refers to the sol solute. And so you can write kilograms per meter cube or kilograms of dye per meter cube, kilograms of bacteria per meter cube, whatever the sol solute is that you're dealing with over here. The next part of the question then gave the correlation or as some people refer to it as the correlation, but it's really the equation that defines the characteristic operation of the membrane. The membrane's operating characteristic JV is given by that 0.04 times the log of 15 divided by C, where the bulk concentration C has units of kilograms per meter cubed, the same units as C coming in here, and the flux is measured in meters cubed per hour per meter squared, so it's a volumetric flux. So people, well, at least two or three people emailed saying there was a bit of confusion there about C. I don't accept that it was that confusing. And here's why. So let's just read this email here. The description of C, uh, the concentration term, was the bulk concentration. This confused people, including myself, who took that to me, and was referring to the inlet concentration. If you're given an empirical equation, make sure to specify completely in terms what the, what the terms in the equation mean, or tell us explicitly so we have to decide what the terms refer to. This is not an empirical equation, this is a derived equation. The key of me deriving this is to show you the structure is a logarithmic relationship there. And we know that at that 15 up in the numerator in the log refers to the wall concentration. So that's the concentration of the buildup of the material at the wall of the membrane. The 0.04 is the, is the mass transfer coefficient. 
and J means the flux. So there's not an empirical equation. Uh, the values are determined in that equation based on experiments, as, as was mentioned in the question. So this issue here about C being confusing, um, and I didn't know what the bulk concentration was, and I used the inlet concentration, is I don't accept that as being, um, as being an issue. The reason is, if you look back at slide 31, bulk and JV are explicitly defined. So if we go back here to 31, we explicitly define what bulk concentration is in this slide. Here, C is the solute mass concentration. Of, uh, sorry, we explicitly define what JV is. So JV is the permeate volumetric flow rate. So notice that permeate is the volume of the permeate flowing through the membrane, neither. Uh, solute flux out of the membrane, uh, and the solute flux towards the membrane is made up of JV times C. If you look through the units, so that is flow rate of the solids towards the membrane. JV refers to the flow rate of the permeate through to out of the membrane. And then C is referred to as the concentration in the bulk. In the video in the class, now I hate listening to my own voice, but I will do this to emphasize it. So if we, if we come back here, then we've got this equation and for JV, we can, we can write it down just uh, for our ref reference here that JV is the volumetric flow times 0.04 times the log of 15, the wall concentration divided by C. So just leave that general for now. And now we're ready to, 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 to start this question. Finally, it says uh, the last piece of information we're given is that there's two <coughs> membrane modules, each of 25 meters squared, connected in series. This is the insight that you needed in this, in this question. This was the only piece that was potentially confusing, um, was the insight that you need to understand that it's the retentate from the membrane that shifted over to the next module. So the permeate over here leaving, so we call that QP1 from the first membrane leaving with concentration CP1, but it's the retentate that leaves and gets connected up into the next membrane. And even that, I'll argue, is not too much to, to try and figure out. Because if our objective is to concentrate out the dye, here we've got our dye coming in at a, at a low concentration, we know that the permeate leaving the membrane is essentially got no <coughs> solids in it. We've made that assumption several times that CP is equal to zero. The concentration of permeates is, is zero. So it wouldn't make sense to link this stream up to the next membrane. The only stream that makes sense to link up to the, the second membrane in the series is, in fact, the retentate stream. So QR1 and CR1. It's the retentate concentration from the first membrane that gets concentrated up. And we've got. Uh, the retentate leaving from the second membrane. So let's call that QR2 and CR2. And then the permeate leaving from this first membrane, uh, so from the second membrane, QP2 and CP2. So this membrane here is A1 and A2 respectively. Just getting that down is easily about six marks out of the 24. Just illustrating that and, and illustrating that notation is, is worth a heck of a lot. 
because it indicates to me that you've understood which streams go away. That's the key insight I wanted from that question. So when people freak out on the, on the emails and say, this material is 25% of the midterm, I've basically lost 24% of my grade here. No, you haven't. Absolutely, you haven't. The only way you lost 24% of your grade is if you totally left this question empty. But just putting down the information that you understand from the question in a diagram, showing that you've linked up the idea correctly, is worth a heck of a lot. Solving the answer numerically in this question counts for, I think, I allocated four or six marks out of the 24 just to solving the, the equations. Just setting up the problem and setting up the mass balance and the volume balance is going to get you about 60% of the marks here. So the point is not just to give up on the, on the numeric side. Let's take a look now at the questions and answer those. So the first part is asking for the dye concentration from the first membrane module. The dye concentration from the first membrane module is this guy over here, CR1. We're looking at finding CR1. That's our unknown. We saw in the previous class that to, to set this problem up, one of the ways to do it is to do a mass balance over the membrane. So let's do a mass balance over this first membrane. We don't do a mass balance over the entire system to start with. The question actually guiding you on that is asking you for the first membrane. To do the, the reason is because they're in series. If you can solve the first equations, this membrane can stand totally on its own. This membrane, there's no recycle from the second membrane back over here. There's no need to do a global mass balance. This membrane is totally decoupled. The first membrane, that's what series implies. This first membrane is totally independent of the downstream. So I can solve everything on that, that first one. So if we set up the mass balance for the first membrane, we say Q0, the inlet mass times C0, is equal to the retentate flow, QR1, times the mass concentration in the, in the retentate, plus the flow rate in QP, the permeate in the first membrane, times CP1. <coughs> That's our mass balance over the first membrane. And we can simplify it directly by saying that term is zero, so essentially it drops out. The concentration of the permeate is essentially zero. It's a standard assumption for all concentration. So this is simply a mass balance. The volume balance over the membrane says Q0 is equal to the retentate flow rate plus the permeate flow rate. So this is equation two, our volume balance. And then the third equation that we have is this flux equation. So JB is a flux, JV refers to the flux through the permeate. So it's this flow rate of the liquid through the membrane. Let's be clear on that. It's JV is QP, it's related to QP. The flow rate of the permeate divided by the area is equal to 0 0.04 times the log of 15 divided by C. That C refers to the retentate composition. It does not refer to the permeate's composition. It can't because that assumption is that it's zero over there, so we'd be taking the log of infinity, and that doesn't make numeric sense. But it's also not the feed concentration. That was emphasized several times in the class. The concentration <coughs> of the permeate, the concentration in the bulk of the of the material of the membrane. So that refers there to CR1. Now, if we look at this, we've got three equations. We're aiming at finding CR1, but we don't have, it seems, enough information to solve this. We know Q0, we know C0, but we've got several unknowns. We don't know QR1, we don't know CR1, that's what we're trying to solve. We don't know QP1, so there's one, two, three unknowns so far. QR1 appears here again. QP1 appears there, QP1 appears here, and CR1. So three equations, three unknowns. Non-linear, oh my god, what am I going to do? Okay, this is 
even if you did this though, you'd probably get the majority of the correct sort of this question. So that's, I mean, I'm not testing and solving sets of nonlinear equations, but this really isn't uh, that hard to solve. One, one thing we do is, when we present it with this, we substitute equations into each other. This is the standard method you've learned in, in your math courses, and physics courses, and, and probably even high school. So what we, what we do is we recognize we're solving here for CR1. This is my, my target. If we look here, I don't know QP1, but I have QP1 in terms of CR1 down here. I don't have QR1, but I have QR1 in terms of QP1, and then I have QP1 again here in terms of CR1. So by successfully substituting equations into each other, I can, I can solve them for CR1. So if we take this equation up here, write it for CR1 is equal to Q0 times uh, C0 divided by QP1. <laughs> But QP1 is equal to Q0 minus QR1. And this function is going to do something like that. 
And we're going to find a lower bound and an upper bound and find where that function crosses zero. What is, what is an initial guess for CR? If you had to guess a value for CR, what would you say would be a, a, a reasonable value for it? CR1. This is, this, is the, this is the main part, right? So solving this really quickly, being able to come up with a suitable initial guess is going to save you a ton of time. What is an initial guess for CR1 that's reasonable? Two. Two? What is a lower bound for CR1? 1.2. 1.2. CR1 cannot be lower than 1.2. What's a reasonable upper bound? 14. 14? Why 14? Exactly. You can't exceed the wall concentration, which is 15. So you bound it between 1.2 and 15. Where to start? 7, 5, 10. Any one of those will get you a very quick answer. So here's, here's um, when I did it, I was using 3. 3 is my first one, so F of CR1 equals 3. If you solve that, you get a value of minus 0.84, so you're negative. Well, that's too low. Let me try a higher value, CR1, equals, I tried 8, and you get 9.9. .9. Very quickly, you, I think I just did two, two iterations, then I tried 4, and then you get a value of 0.87. So here I'm too low when I'm 3, with 8 I'm too high, I'm way too high, so I came back right now, 4, with four, I'm still too high. I said, well, if it's not three, if three gets me minus 0.84, and four gets me plus 0.8, 0.35. So then CR1 equals, sorry, 3.5 gets you pretty close to zero at f of x. Once you have CR1, you can go back to this equation up here and solve for Q, QR1. Okay, so I'll just put the, put the numbers up here. The solving for QR1 is um, 0.75 meters Q per hour. <coughs> and then solving for QP1 is 1.45 meters Q per hour.